Well, well hello everybody. Thanks for coming along to, to hear uh, well, both this introduction and uh, to hear the reading of uh, A Christmas Carol. Uh, I think you will enjoy it. Um, so the first thing, Christmas Carol, of course, is the story of Mr. Scrooge. And everybody knows Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge is the archetypal miser, a cold and miserable miser. In fact, just today, I saw a headline in a newspaper saying, uh, unions criticize Mr. Hancock's Scrooge letter to the NHS. Uh, so the unions are criticizing the uh, health minister for a letter he'd written to the the uh, medical people about pay. And they use Scrooge in the, in the caption on this uh, uh, newspaper to indicate that they thought it was a, a, a miserly uh, approach. And uh, if you look up the word Scrooge in the dictionary, which I did, it just says a miser. So if you call someone a Scrooge, you're calling them a miser. But of course, this is very unfair to Mr. Scrooge, yeah? Ebenezer Scrooge was not a miser earlier in his life, and he was not a miser later in his life. Uh, Mr. Scrooge has a completely different significance. Uh, what Mr. Scrooge is, is he's a, a really great symbol of transformation. So that's the key thing about Mr. Scrooge. He represents the human potential for transformation. So, a very Buddhist theme in a way. Mr. Scrooge is like Mara becomes a Bodhisattva. That's, that should be the headline, yeah? And uh, of course, the, the story is about how that transformation happens, how Mr. Scrooge is, becomes totally transformed. And, and how does it happen? Well, he has a vision. Uh, you could even say he has a, a, a spiritual vision, which shows him the consequences of his actions and his attitudes. Um, uh, but of course, to have a vision like that, uh, it means that he's already had the potential for change. Uh, it was just waiting to be sparked off. So the conditions for the vision to, to arise, as it were, had to be part of his makeup in order for him to have that vision. In other words, he was never wholly bad. Uh, in the story, we get some hints about why he became a miser, and why he became obsessed with, uh, with hoarding money. So Scrooge's vision uh, consists of being visited by four phantoms or four ghosts. Uh, so there's first there's the ghost of Marley, who was his, his former business partner uh, and who's been dead for, for seven years. And Marley's ghost is this horrible figure with, uh, with uh, chains tied around him and trailing behind him, these chains. And on the chains, uh, tied onto the chains are cash boxes and padlocks and keys and steel purses, all sorts of things to do with money, ledgers and things like that. Uh, and he's, he's dragging this chain behind him. And, and Scrooge asks him about this chain, and, and Marley's ghost tells him that the chain he's wearing was the chain he forged during his lifetime by his actions and his views. So this is the first teaching about actions having consequences. Uh, and Marley, uh, Marley's ghost goes on to give Scrooge uh, a teaching also about the real business of life, what life is really about. So you can listen out for that teaching in the, I think it's in the next reading tomorrow evening. And then Scrooge is visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present and future. So when he visits the past, uh, we get a glimpse of the background that has led him to be becoming such a, a, a bitter person, such a bitter miser. Uh, he was a very lonely boy. His mother was dead. His father was distant. He was sent away to school. Uh, he was sent away, uh, most importantly, from his beloved sister. His sister, Fanny, was the only person he loved and who loved him. And, and they were parted. 
so he was very lonely in his in his boarding school and and he lived in in books and stories uh, and then when he when he left school he became an apprentice and he was quite happy as an apprentice with mr fezziwig uh, whom we'll hear about later uh, but then something happened and what happened was a terrible loss his sister died so his beloved sister fanny died and uh, the story doesn't uh, make it explicit, but she may have died in childbirth, uh, and she may have died giving birth to Scrooge's nephew, whom we meet quite early on in the story. Um, and this nephew is perhaps, uh, for Scrooge, means two different things. The, the nephew is the one that Scrooge blames for his sister's death, and at the same time is a reminder of his sister's loving nature. So there's a, the nephew sparks off a kind of inner conflict in, in Scrooge that may have been the, the catalyst for his uh, visionary experience. So Scrooge has had a, a, an emotionally impoverished childhood and, and a trauma of a great loss. So of course, when people have trauma and, and, uh, and emotional impoverishment and so on, people, look for something to, to cope with that. So some people turn to drink or drugs or whatever. Scrooge turned to money. Uh, he, he made money his God. And in doing that, he also lost his fiance, who saw him growing into a, a cold and, and distant figure. So the ghost of Christmas past takes Scrooge on a journey into his past, into his childhood. Uh, and seeing his younger self, that's the, the first thing that starts to, to melt his heart, so to speak. And then the ghost of Christmas present shows him how others are, are happy uh, without wealth, without money. Uh, it shows him Bob Cratchit's family and his nephew's family and so on. And how they have a wealth of, of loving relationships. Uh, so his heart is melting a little bit more when he sees this. Uh, and then the ghost of the future is a stark warning uh, that his current uh, attitudes and, and uh, actions will lead to a bleak and, and loveless death. So these, these ghosts are, are the visionary experience. They could be seen as a kind of welling up from uh, the depths of his unconscious mind, a welling up of something he already knows but has deliberately avoided. Anyway, this visionary insight leads him to want to change his life completely. And he does. He becomes, immediately after this experience, he becomes ecstatically happy and he laughs out loud. Dickens says that for someone who hasn't laughed for so long, he's got a very good laugh. And uh, he dances for joy. He dances around his room. And he becomes extremely generous. And he notices that everywhere uh, uh, he looks and everything he sees uh, gives him pleasure. So he's totally transformed. And of course, some people laugh at him. They laugh at this change in him. Uh, not everyone is, is pleased to see people change, even, even change for the better. And although he's uh, totally changed into a very generous and warm-hearted person, his bad reputation never leaves him. In fact, it's still with him 200 years later. So it's relatively easy to acquire a bad reputation and very, very difficult to lose it. Mr. Scrooge gained self-knowledge uh, through being granted this visionary experience, uh, this kind of overview of his whole life uh, and where it was leading. And uh, we could say that there are lessons for all of us in, uh, in A Christmas Carol and in the story of the, of the miser Scrooge and of the, the big-hearted Ebenezer Scrooge. There's lessons about the consequences of, of attitudes and actions. Uh, there's lessons about uh, knowing, uh, knowing yourself, understanding yourself, reflecting on your life. Uh, there's lessons about the possibility of change. 
uh, lessons about the importance of being less self-centered and the importance of other people and of uh, of all our our human our human want our human relationships. So some people say that the, what the story is really about is the contrast between the how the world is and how the world should be. Uh, or perhaps if we want to put that more personal, make that more personal, we could say it's about the contrast between how we are and how we ought to be. So that's just a little by way of introduction to hopefully as you listen to the story throughout, you'll, you'll see some of those themes and maybe other themes that Dasney will bring out on the last evening. But let's move on now and uh, in a way, let the story speak for itself. Uh, oops, um, sorry about that. I'm going to change the uh, picture here just to mark the change of mood. So, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Marley was dead, to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor. Sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. Even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him, 
He iced the office in the dog days and didn't thaw it out one degree at Christmas. External heath and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely. Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, that he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighbouring offices, like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it. For Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intima intimation he had of his approach. Ah, said Scrooge, humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas? What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, 
returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas? Out upon a merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without any money? A time for finding yourself a year old and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you? If I could work my will, says Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, said Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good has it done you. There are many things from which I may have derived good, but which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure that I have always thought of Christmas time, when it does come round, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they were really fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures on some other journey. And therefore, uncle, though it was never, it has never put a scrap of gold or, or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, said Scrooge's nephew, why? Why did you get married, said Scrooge? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I've been a party, but I've made the trial in homage to Christmas and I'll keep my Christmas humor. So a Merry Christmas, uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge, and a happy new year. 
Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas, I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word, liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons, said Scrooge? Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge, are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they weren't. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind and body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, said Scrooge. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the establishments I've mentioned. They cost enough. And those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. and Many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and reduce the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, said the gentleman. It's not my business, said Scrooge. It's enough for a man to understand his own business. 
and not to interfere with other people's, mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual for him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses in carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a Gothic window, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some labourers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocer's trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house gave orders to his 50 cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should. And even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, the little tailor stirred up tomorrow's pudding in the garret, while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good Saint Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God bless ye, merry gentlemen, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and the even more congenial frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted to the, fact, the fact to his expectant clerk, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge buttoning his greatcoat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, 
went down a slide on Corn Hill at the end of a lane of boys 20 times to honour its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of a building up a yard where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house playing at hide and seek with other houses and have forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough for nobody lived in it but Scrooge. The other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a big bold word, the corporation aldermen and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face, Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the, in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as, as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on his ghostly forehead, the hair was curiously stirred as if by breath or, or hot air. And uh, though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That and its livid color made it horrible. But its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door. And he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hole. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, pooh, pooh, and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appears to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door 
and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. Tune in tomorrow for the next episode.